Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for joining our class today. Uh, today we have a guest. He is William Alexander McCormick Rivera. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Sciences and International Relations. He has a Master's of Arts in Social Policy and Planning, Environmental Planning and Natural Resource Management. And he's the Assistant Director at Corporación del Proyecto Enlace El Caño Martín Peña. So he's joining from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, we're very uh, happy to have him today to talk about El Caño Martín Peña and El, el Comiso de Comunitario de Tierras del Caño Martín Peña. So uh, William, thank you so much for joining us today and feel free to start whenever you're ready. So thank you for inviting me to this class, uh, Samantha and Jose. And um, thank you to the students to um and get getting up early in the morning here and listen to the Caño Martin Peña project. So I am I will share my screen right now. Give me a second. Let me know if you can see the the screen, please, because I can see you. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Looking at it now. So whenever you have to interrupt me or have a um a question or anything, let me know because I can't see the the Zoom page because I am in in the full screen presentation. Thank you. So again, thank you for having me here. Um, my name, as Samantha said, is William McCormick. I'm a professional planner in Puerto Rico, and I have been working for the Caño Martin Peña communities uh, around six years ago. Um, today, I will be presenting the Caño Martin Peña Special Planning Districts, its community context, and the role of public participation in the policy making. So, a little bit of context. As you may know, Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory since 19, 8, 8, 1898 um, with a population of 3.1 uh, million habitants and our main uh, language is Spanish. Um, so the Caño Martin Peña is located in the northern area of Puerto Rico, uh, specifically in the San Juan municipality um, the capital of Puerto Rico and one of the most uh, population um, with the most dense uh, metropolitan area. As I said, um, the Caño Martin Peña is a 3.7 um, tidal channel that's formed part of the water bodies of the uh, by estuario of Bahia de San Juan. It's a tropical estuary um, and this uh, a channel is in the center of this um, of the of the Adore area, which is a, a community in San Juan. So, if you can, as as you can see, uh, you can it is the red uh, the red line in the middle of the page. As you can see, if this area were not clogged, like like it is right now that you can um, travel uh, with the boat from the point one, which is uh, the Bahia uh, de San Juan, or San Juan Bay, uh, to the uh, crossing the Caño through other uh, municipality uh, that they, uh, is called uh, Carolina. So from Cataño, which is a, a, a municipality, to, through San Juan to uh, Carolina crossing all these um, water bodies. So Puerto Rico is an archipelago and is an island. So it's important to conserve our coastline ecosystem and prevent erosion. So that is the, the mangrove uh, principal role. And 30% of the total mangrove acres um, of Puerto Rico are located in this estuary, the San Juan Bay estuary. So with eight endangered spa animal spaces, 
and uh, plant and 17 endangered plant spaces and a diversity of flora and fauna. A, a little bit of content about uh, the Caño Martin Peña communities. Um, Caño Martin Peña's a community are composed about uh, eight communities that surround the, the water body or, or the channel. Um, the, the Caño Martin Peña's eight communities are mostly informal settlements um, which almost 11,000 residents that live uh, next to the environmental degraded clogged tidal channel. Most lack of sanitary sewers and um, sanitary sewers and pluvial pluvial uh, systems, and and the estimate shows that over three thousand structures discharge raw sewage in the caño, but also uh, approximately two thousand families lack of land titles and property rights to live. Uh, to the lands that they are live uh, for five or uh, six generations. So 23% uh, percent of the populations are immigrants or foreign and burned population. And 60% of these uh, populations report to be uh, uh, be below of the income of poverty in the United States. Um, with a median income of to uh, ten or eleven thousand uh, dollars. So this is a photo of the beginning of the cell. Um, so they were uh, uh, moving from the uh, rural areas to the metropolitan areas. A little bit of uh, history, as I would say uh, before, uh, the mangrove in Puerto Rico are very important because the protection of the um, coastline ecosystem, but it was not, not conceived uh, as it from forever is, um, it was uh, in the 1900, um, it was conceived as a, a problem. The mangroves are conceived as a, as a problem. So in the, in the, in the 1900, over the, begin the over exploitation of the mangroves for firewood and charcoal. In the 1910s, uh, the wetland adjacent to the caño were used as disposal area to the San Juan uh, Harbor beach material. In the 20s, the Senate resolved, um, our uh, legis legislators resolved that mangrove could be sold as they were associated with the malaria mosquito. And um, the government started to uh, build the first uh, 200 houses in Barrio Vero, one of the first uh, eight communities uh, located in the, in the Caño. So, in, in the forest, the downfall of the sugarcane industry and hurricanes San Felipe and San Ciprian intensified the migration to San Juan and the um, informal settlements in the Caño Martin Peña. Puerto Rico was passing uh, from a, a agro system to industrial system. So the people in the rural um, began to move to the, uh, to the city to work with uh, fabrics and other um, industries. So in, in the 80s, the government reached the western portion of the Caño uh, Martin Peña to conduct a project that they called Agua Guagua. This project was, was a, a public transportation project um, with a water transportation project but it was conducted without public participation. So um, the communities in the Western portion of the Caño were removed um, without any uh, rights or, uh, or participation um, in the project. So in the 2000s, the Eastern side of the Caño, the, the communities in the Eastern side of the Caño start to 
organizing because they know that the that projects will be continuing the in that in her side in their side so they they were in risk so these photos show let me know if you are seeing the two maps yes yes okay so this for in this photo you can see the beginning of the informal settlements in the Caño Martin Peña the first uh, photo in the in the right is the is uh, almost 1930s uh, settlements and the the bottom one is the uh, 19 um 2019 photos so um you know that that the informal settlements continue with the uh, support of the government and without the support of the government. So these historical marginalized communities migrate from rural to the city and create these informal settlements on the banks of the Caño Martin Peña with lack of adequate infrastructure, so, such as sanitary and storm sewer systems, um, causing clogged channel and also urban floodings with contaminated water, with consequences such as respiratory disease, stomach, skin, and other health issues. So as I was saying, in, in the 2000s, the uh, community start um, to organize. They already know about wh what happened uh, to the other community like Panguito and, and Tokyo. Those communities were disappeared because of the Awawawa project. And uh, they, well, they already know that it will happen to them if they don't organize. So in 2002, they founded the G8 O El G8 in Spanish, a nonprofit um, grassroots organization, um, and they incorporated it in 2004. The same year, after more of 1,700 uh, meetings, participation, self organized efforts uh, uh, from the G8 achieved the creation of Proyecto Enlace and impulse legislation that conclude in the creation of the comprehensive plan, the uh, comprehensive development plan and a law uh, 489 of 2004. So this project was uh, set in a philosophy or uh, of participatory action planning. Um, citizen uh, is a citizen participatory uh, methodology uh, that over that um, in this community means over um, 120 leaders between youth and adults. They participate in director boards, representation, social, and they conduct social actions, um, conference, uh, press conference, presentations. Um, manifestations and assemblies, etc. So, as part of the struggle of the communities, they, um, as I said before, they conduct a comprehensive integral um, development plan, and also they uh, they pass a law. Uh, they impose the the approve the approval of a for. 2089 uh, um, of 2004 uh, at and that at create three uh, two organizations the G8 is, is the uh, the one in the center that is the activity community the active community participation that promotes and power of the community involvement but they also create a public corporation that they call Corporación del Proyecto Enlace del Caño Martín Peña, because the, the comprehensive plan is, uh, the name of the comple comprehensive plan is the Proyecto Enlace del Caño Martín Peña, but the corporation is the one um, in charge of coordination and implementation of the comprehensive development plan and act as non-federal sponsor for the Caño Martín Peña Public Corporation. So as they create this plan and um, the, the most important project uh, of this plan is the bridge of on um, the restoration of the tidal channel of the Caño Martin Peña, but as a comprehensive plan, they have also 
um, so many other infrastructure and social projects that I will discuss later. So they also create the Fideicomiso de la Tierra del Caño Martín Peña, which is, which is a community land trust to um, protect the community from the uh, speculation of the land and regulates the uh, land tenure and attends to, to situations, the informal settlements, um, the people without property rights, and also the speculation that will be um, part of the um, implementation of the, all these projects. So back in the 2004, the Caño Mar Martin Peña has a struggle to um, be recognized by the uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers because as a territory, all water bodies, bodies in Puerto Rico are in charge of the uh, US Army's Corps of Engineers. So they, they didn't want to recognize this project because uh, political issues, including um, the, the one in the, in the, main, in the US mainland, and others, similar projects that they don't have the funding to conduct. So in 2017, in 2007, sorry, the US Congress authorized the Caño Martin Peña Environmental um, Impact Assessment. In 2010, the Enlace Project uh, starts uh, start to conduct the report. This report was in charge of the U. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, but they were um, so late in the process. So the, the corporation, the public corporation, or the non-federal as a non-federal partnership, start to, to conduct the environmental impact statement. So in, in 2012, the United States Army Corps of Engineers and Enlace signed an agreement to recognize the environmental impact, impact statement and uh, in, initiate a, a technical re review. And in 2016, they approved this, uh, this document and start the design agreement of, for the project. Recently, this year, after 20 years of struggle of these communities, and all the work from the Corporación Proyecto Enlace and Fideicomiso de la Tierra, the federal government allocated um, the funds to conduct the total of the project, uh, around uh, $163, only the federal part. And we, in here in Puerto Rico, are in charge to identify the uh, um, federal match, uh, like $35 uh, million. So this project will start in 2023, uh, um, but they, we already have uh, conduct a project uh, in the area to prepare to the, uh, the phase one of this project. This is the main page of one of our um, um, principal newspaper uh, announcing the uh, allocation of the funds. So this uh, project from the Caño Martin Peña, as you, uh, you can see, um, the, the initial parts um, are the um, cleaning or restoring the uh, mangrove in the area, then they will dredge the, uh, then will they will uh, re reinforce some of the bridge, one bridge here and two others bridge here and here. So, and the third contract is to uh, start the construction phase of the, of the project. Um, we also have um, too, uh, too many projects uh, not, not related directly to the Canyon Bridge or restoration, 
Um, we also have a comprehensive water infrastructure plan um, because we need to know um, how the community will be affected from the dredge, but also from uh, the project that will bring their sanitary and um, fluvial or uh, storm um, surge. So there are, are a comprehensive water uh, infrastructure plan that also was uh, made with a co a, the community participation and a continuous consultation and participation of the community in the eight communities. So you also have um, here I'm showing you the renderings of the of the what we'll like to see. The canyon will be a hundred by ten um, deep. Uh, the bridge, and also we'll have some uh, water parks in the in the side of the of the tidal channel. As part of the implementation and the execution of Dragado and the other infrastructure projects, there are some consequences. Some some of the residents have to be relocated from their homes as the project partially funded uh, because as this project is partially funded with federal funds, it's not, com it's not compliant with the Uniform Relocation Act. So the houses that people will be relocated uh, must complete with decent, secure, and sanitary standards. So um, the community create a relocation committee composed from corpor uh, corporation employees and residents who were also relocated themselves. So they meet and discuss every case and visit the family uh, who will be affected and inspect the homes that, we, that the people will be relocated. Um, this is an ongoing project. You can see the uh, 1994 um, map the progress in the in 2004 and the progress in 2019 um and you can see the uh, reality of their houses right now their um um relocation process and the houses that they um live right now so as part of this project the uh, community themselves have um determinate that they will prefer to stay in the community. So there's no many um, houses that comply with the, the safe and sanitary housing uh, uh, regulations. So we also develop um, houses to, uh, come to have uh, uh, the opportunity to give, to give the opportunity to the people to stay in the community. So those houses are um, designed in a participatory workshop, um, as you can see in those pictures. But also, we have over 30 program, programs for socioeconomic development impacting over um, uh, 1,000 um, residents annually of all years. So we have community gardens, adult literacy programs, violence prevention programs, uh, participatory designs, as you can see in the last uh, slide, um, uh, a program that they call, call uh, LIHAC, which in Spanish means Líderes Jóvenes en Acción. Uh, uh, they are also a, a grassroots, incorporated grassroots in Puerto Rico organization. So we also have environmental awareness uh, programs with uh, the program that they call EDRAS, Estudiantes Dispuestos a la Restauración eh, Ambiental, eh, Community rec recycling, recycling sorry, Programs, eh, School Gardens, um, Public Health, health Initiative, uh, Continuous Critical Talk um, uh, Workshops, and also Community Business Incubators. This, this one in, the, in uh, re, uh, Community Resulting is one of the communities uh, uh, business incubated back to 2008. And this one is 
they, they are not operating right now, but this one is a community um, a community business for um, bring tours to the uh, Caño Martin Peña uh, communities to uh, tourists or um, local residents. We also uh, respond in um, in time of crisis like Huracan Maria and Huracan Irma. Uh, we were uh, there as first response with the community volunteers and all the community organizations, etc. So as a consequence of the implementation of this plan, um, the community land trust was part of the uh, law, uh, 489 law, and the law created the land trust and passed a, a, all government lands of the, the district to the land trust management. So the, the Fideicomiso de la Tierra is a land trust um, and it is a noble mechanism to attend the informality and prevent the real estate speculation and displacement. Um, when it became loud, the communities fought for the return of the lands of, uh, to the community land trust to continue the development of the uh, Caño Martin Peña community. So I would like to explain a little bit, but I, I would uh, like to show you a video that explain how it uh, this works. El fideicomiso de la tierra. Un fideicomiso es como un contrato donde una persona protege los bienes de otra persona. Probablemente hayas escuchado que se usan para administrar dinero, propiedades y cosas así, pero hoy vamos a aprender sobre algo nuevo, el fideicomiso de la tierra. ¿Y qué es eso? Pues para entender desde el principio, déjame contarte una historia. Hace muchos años atrás, la industrialización de Puerto Rico causó que mucha gente que vivía en el campo se mudara a la capital para trabajar en las fábricas. Poco a poco, estas familias construyeron sus casas en los márgenes del Caño Martín Peña para así estar más cerca de sus trabajos. Y así, crearon comunidades que han permanecido por generaciones. Como se imaginan, todo ha crecido a su alrededor. Autopistas, negocios, la zona bancaria, centros comerciales. Con el tiempo, estos humildes terrenos se empezaron a ver muy atractivos para los especuladores. Así que poco a poco han tratado de desplazar a estas familias. Pero no es tan fácil. Verás, como estas comunidades llevan aquí tantos años, algunas familias tienen un título de propiedad individual. O sea, un título que dice que ese pedacito de tierra donde ellos viven les pertenece a ellos. Las comunidades están compuestas de muchos pedacitos de tierra habitadas por familias, algunas con sus propios títulos. Pero ¿qué pasa? Como hay residentes que están pendientes en defender solo su propia tierra, la comunidad se convierte en un blanco fácil para que desarrolladores y especuladores inescrupulosos se aprovechen de esto. Y así, como ovejitas solitarias, es muy fácil convencer a las familias individuales de que vendan sus tierras. Puede que no te suene grave de momento, pero la realidad es que la gente termina vendiendo sus títulos por un valor muy poco bajo, al que luego el comprador le sacará provecho. Cuando terrenos que han estado en nuestras familias por generaciones son vendidos por tan poco dinero, eso es un mal negocio. Y la verdad es que separados es muy poco lo que podemos hacer para defendernos. ¿Qué tal si hubiese una manera de proteger el bienestar de todos los miembros de la comunidad de estas y otras injusticias? Y así, las comunidades del caño se organizaron y surgió la idea del fideicomiso de la tierra. ¿Se acuerdan cuando dijimos que un fideicomiso es un contrato donde una persona protege los bienes de otro? Pues el fideicomiso de la tierra es eso mismo, pero representa a todos los miembros que viven en nuestra comunidad. Es, por decirlo así, un guardián gigante, producto de la unión de todos sus miembros. Gracias al fideicomiso de la tierra, cuando un especulador venga a tratar de convencer a doña Mercedes de que le venda su tierra por una miseria, doña Mercedes puede decir no, habla con mi guardián el fideicomiso de la tierra es el instrumento perfecto para promover la integración de los miembros de nuestra comunidad, así como para defendernos en contra del desplazamiento y poder desarrollar nuestras casas y vecindad. Mediante el fideicomiso, cada familia es dueña individual de su vivienda y recibirá una escritura de derecho de superficie. Este derecho de superficie sobre el solar donde está la casa se puede vender, heredar o hipotecar. Es un derecho que tiene valor y aumenta la riqueza familiar, una mejor alternativa a los tradicionales títulos individuales, ya que 
todos somos dueños colectivamente de la tierra y la tierra no se vende. Así que ya sabes los beneficios importantes de pertenecer al fideicomiso de la tierra, ese guardián gigante de los derechos de nuestra comunidad, que se hace más y más fuerte cuando nos unimos todos. Con el fideicomiso de la tierra, la tierra es de todos. Únete. So, as the video explained, the, um, uh, the surface, uh, surface right deed um, is a, um, a document that gives the um, uh, right to um, of the of the use of the land, and um, in every individual family will be owner of the structure. But the land will be collective, um, with a collective property. So we have, uh, right now more than a uh, hundred uh, surface drive grids, but also total uh, two hundred members, land trust members. So you can see the process that is conducted with uh, the voluntary or pro, pro bono uh, notaries in Puerto Rico and. Um, they have an accompany, uh, a, a process with uh, help with the communities. Uh, they help the community in all the process of the, um, the surfers right bits. This is a photo of one of the, our members, um, uh, Caraballo, and it's, it's a part of the community education in the, the uh, putting those uh, uh, a message around the uh, property that are a part of the community land trust. So as a community land trust, we, uh, we also um, uh, rescue uh, some uh, uh, backend lots and convert the backend lot that means a problem to the community in a solution and create uh, urban uh, or community gardens. But we also have uh, uh, in the Fideicomiso a variety of programs, including uh, the Proyecto de Recreación, Integración y Empoderamiento de la, de la Persona Adulto Mayor, which is a, a project to um, bring the participation to older people in the community. Also, so we have Cero Brecha Tech, which um, um, is a project that connects the people, the older people without um, knowledge of um, technology, we, um, brings uh, a workshop to the people to um, learn about this technology. Um, we also have the Techo Digno project, which is a small um, uh, rehabilitation of the uh, houses of our members. And um, we conduct uh, assemblies because in the board of director, the, the board of director of the land trust is composed mainly of uh, uh, residents of the Cañón Martin Peña. So this is the, the Proyecto Lazo de Cañón Martin Peña. This uh, land trust is a, a community self-organized project. And I will let you with two quotes right here. This one, it says, y por primera vez los residentes fuimos actores de nuestro futuro. So meaning that the, for the first time they um, decide for the future of the land that they have inhabited from five generations. And um, I would like to conclude with a, a little long quote, but um, every time I have the opportunity to talk about the students, I uh, share this fragment of test that um, once a, a professor uh, uh, teach to me. So it said, es verdad, Atender los asuntos de una calle, de un barrio, de una escuela, no resolverán los problemas de Puerto Rico. Podemos decir en este caso del Perú también. 
pero si no nos insertamos en la solución de los problemas prácticos y cotidianos, nos convertiremos nosotros en parte del problema del país. No se puede aprender a nadar si uno no se tira al agua. Si no, no, si no desarrollamos los músculos de la praxis, quedaremos atrofiados, pobres custodios eh, de saberes recónditos que nunca son puestos a prueba. Seamos atrevidos en nuestro servicio comunitario, porque nuestro sueño de una sociedad más justa y más equitativa cobra vida cada vez que caminamos esa calle, exploramos ese barrio y reinventamos esa escuela. Aprender a soñar en plural es posible si nos ejercitamos en pensar en plural. Es hacer las tareas del futuro lo que precipita el futuro entre nosotros. Eso es una cita de Fernando Pico, eh, en paz descanse, historiador, profesor y uh, sacerdote jesuita. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, William, uh, very much for the presentation. Uh, this has been a really, really interesting. The, the case of um, of the Caño Martin Peña um, is very much in the um, in the conversation, this is something that uh, that's, that's an experience that uh, we've been um, following very closely, I will say, uh, in general in Latin America. So it's really nice to, to have you here and to see the presentation that you have done. Uh, actually, I will even say that um, the experience that you're showing is, uh, I will say, as the last quote uh, said it, a very that uh, something that is relevant for the for the neighborhoods there in San Juan, but also in general for neighborhoods in Latin America, because it is basically giving us an option or an alternative that uh, many policies in urbanism and housing haven't explored yet. Uh, that is doing things for the community, but having those things uh, be preserved there and not maybe uh, through other mechanisms that maybe are going to just uh, generate some process of displacement with gentrification and things like that, because there are ways like the uh, Fideicomiso Comunitario de Tierras that allows us to have the community there both with the titles and with the with their participation. So I think that's, that's also um, very important here in Peru because this is also a, a mechanism, uh, the Fideicomiso Comunitario de Tierras, that is now in the Peruvian laws, uh, and it is now in the process of being studied, uh, better regulated, and uh, hopefully implemented at some in some projects. So that's just to to give a, a framework of where where there may be some things. And here in the in the class, we have some students of law. So I think that's also something that uh, will be interested to to bring there. So uh, I will say maybe we can um, first open it to to any question or comment uh, of the students. Uh, if you have any reaction to uh, William's presentation, we had some uh, some quotes that the students brought for the for the session uh, we, with the reading that we had. I had one here written of uh, of Hano, if I don't know if you want to uh, talk about that one, but I, but in general, I don't know if there is any comment or question, so we can begin there. And from there, we can uh, just uh, open the conversation. Um, may I start? Yeah, please go ahead, Hano. Okay. Uh, okay, um, the case that you, William, presented us, uh, remember, well, reminds me to my uh, home city. Uh, my, I'm from Chimbote, and also I have seen uh, people living near to a swamp. Uh, um, uh, I find some, I found some simil similarities between the case of, uh, or, or the case of, Caño Martin Peña and uh, Villa Maria's Villa Maria Swans because uh, I also found there because I live near uh, that near that song uh, how people is, is how people are starting uh, to uh, create their community sense and to help uh, each other in order to continue living there 
because due to a phenomenal niño of 2017, uh, they were, well, local government tried to uh, relocate them in other areas, uh, but they didn't want to uh, get out of there. So they stayed and they made a uh, and they made a union uh, during that problem uh, in order to keep uh, living there, even if it's well, it was not the best option for them due to living near to swamp uh, the, and near to some fabrics. But it's interesting how uh, they started to develop uh, their community sense in order to keep their houses. Um, also, uh, I find another similarity because uh, the reason why they are living here to a swamp is because uh, my city has, be has become has become uh, uh, a scholar, well, a mecca for students because in the Santa province, uh, most of the students uh, have to come to Chimbote in order to study because uh, most of the uh, school, well, most of the most of the offer of from the students, for example, in basic uh, studies and also super studies are in Chimbote, so they come there. And also because most of the works um, that I were remunerated and that also give them more opportunities are in Chimbote. So uh, and due to that, uh, they are moving there. Um, the similarity found there because uh, due to the degradation of uh, Puerto Rico, uh, they are coming to live near to the fabrics. And that's the same that's happening in my city during, due to the uh, fishing. Uh, and some fabrics that are starting to appear in my city. So I will, um, I will say that we can share later uh, contacts uh, with the students because the Fideicomiso, uh, the land trust conducts um, what they call Intercambio Internacional every year. So they, um, the communities um, bring together communities from different uh, co uh, countries. We, all, we have uh, participation in Colombia, in Brazil favelas, in the, the next week we will come uh, go to uh, Bruselas. So it will be nice to know more about the organization happening now in Peru and your community. I will also like to recommend you um, a book um, as a planner. Um, I have uh, this reading that they call, uh, uh, listen what they said. Is, is, this is, I call it my Bible, uh, the, my planning Bible, because I have a start studying um, environmental planning. But in the process of uh, doing my master in, in environmental planning, I learned that there's no planning without uh, people, without the people that will be affected of this planning. So um, listen to what they said is a good uh, guide to know what happened when you don't um, consider um, the, the public participation in the process and not as a consultation. It's public real participation from the beginning through the, through the implementation and to the evaluation of the project and continue um, the planning as a cycle process and iterative uh, process. So I would recommend that book. Also the Fideicomiso de la Tierra have like three different uh, books in Spanish and in English. So they um, has written the, uh, the process not the, the the land trusts aren't uh, once are not one side fit all. Is um, every community has to learn what uh, and to seek what fits them well. But the land trust is one of many options. There are uh, cooperative a uh, housing cooperative or co-ops. There are. Um, for the business, they they are uh, they call in Puerto Rico they call the PT eh, eh, trabajadores dueños. Eh, so there's options for the people, but um, we as professionals, as architects, as lawyers, as planners, or uh, anyone interested in the, in urban um, change, but in social justice, 
um, have the the uh, obligation to not uh, acknowledge community participation. Thank you, William. Thank you, Hanu, uh, also for for that comment. Uh, that, that's right, and, and that's some something that uh, Hanu is also working in his exercise here in this course. So I'm I'm glad that you brought it up. I don't know if there is any other uh, comment or question on on the side of the students. I see. Well, I see Joaquin there. Maybe we can go to you, Joaquin. Thank you. Well, thank you, William, for your presentation. It has been great. Uh, I would like to ask you. Two things. Once one, the first one is related more with law. I I understand that is not like the part that you are specialized, but maybe you can give some insights. And it's related to hereditary law, because as I understand the like the capital. I don't know how to say this in English, but the mass of goods and money that you when you die you give to your Years, I right. don't the, remember. Yeah, the, yeah. the assets. You will say the the. I don't know if that's, that's what you mean, but the assets of a person when when this person dies, dies. what happens yeah. with their with their goods and their the all its patrimony, right? Yeah, that's right. So what happens with this? Because in Peru, for example, the uh, corporate like when there is more than one owner of of a of a good of a how do you say of a place uh they cannot transfer and they cannot divide like automatically and as i understood in common law that is the system of puerto rico uh they can do that in a more simple like in a more simpler way so how uh in, in my course of hereditary law the professor critique that in peru there is a lot of uh formalization of property but when it comes to when the people when the person dies, all the formalization process like is like is disappears because all the property that was formalized in titles now belongs to more persons. So I would like to know mm -hmm. how that works in in this community. And that brings me to my second question that is a problem that I understand that happens in Colombia and also in the United States but it's more related to indigenous communities because when like when the past with time people is starts to connect with the other world in some sense like they see other opportunities and people would like to start like going away from leaving their communities so in the experience of uh, indigenous communities what happened is that when okay so I'm part of a, of an indigenous family. My father died. I now, with my brothers, have the land, and they and we do not want to keep him here. We want to go to other country to study or just work in the capital or any other thing like that. So when we want to like sell our land because we are not longer part of a community, we do not feel identified with that. We cannot do that because now that the land is is in a communal system so we cannot dispose of the, we cannot sell the land so that that's the problem that happened in colombia and as i understand also in the united states and that's why in the united states you see a lot of indigenous lands with casinos and things like that mm -hmm. so what's the mechanism in this kind of uh trust land or land trust that you have that you have to avoid them to be like retained and they cannot have access to credit or to the money that its land that their land give them because they are like entitled to what the community decides. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Joaquin. And maybe there are some very specific um, things on the legal side of these kind of things, but I think it's really interesting because there is the question of what happens when a person dies. What happened with the with the with the property there or with the surface right? And also in the case of a family wanting to move for any reason, for example, the one that Joaquin said, it would be interesting to know about the experience of that, uh, William. Yeah. So I'm not an expert of, of law, as you know, but 
um, five years in this uh, place <laughs> teach me a lot about the uh, common law in Puerto Rico and how this works. I will start in, with the second question because here in Puerto Rico, uh, um, different of the United States mainland, we have that no, not issues with the um, indigenous population because um, we have that that's not one of our um, um, problems here or situation, but we have the, the same problem of the people that don't want, don't want to live anymore in the district. Uh, so it kind of the first, I will kind of the first question and this question. Um, so in the case of the herencias, the, uh, it's called the same in, in Peru, no? Yeah, herencias or inheritance, yeah. So in the inheritance or herencias, um, so the property, uh, the surface right uh, deed uh, is editable. So you can um, inherit this, uh, this uh, uh, deed because the, what you are um, inheriting, I don't know if I say it good, but lo que está heredando, um, it's not uh, the uh, structure, the land, uh, you, you are uh, uh, already the um, land use, but the land remains to the uh, district or the land trust. The, what you are uh, hearing is the uh, the house, the structure. If is uh, if you have the uh, documentation to prove that is your father or the land tenure or uh, the well, property tenure, etc. But um, when I said the land trust, it is not one side fits all or the panacea of the solutions is because. We have those problems here too. As you see uh, in the presentation, we uh, have only um, like a hundred, uh, a hundred forty-one um, surface that, uh, right deeds, and it's because it's not. Um, we already know that we have at least two thousand um, people with uh, uh, land tenure or property rights problems. But it's not that easy because there's no documentation to prove that you are the owner of the house. People uh, in informal situation have the dust kind of, prob of problems. So, so it's a continuous process to uh, document the 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 that you are living there because uh, our law, our law, common law systems. Uh, is uh, very as US as United States uh, land, uh, property law uh, strong with the proper private property. So we have that problem here too. So um, what we have done is uh, that we have uh, social workers and um, pro bono uh, lawyers that helps those families to collect all the documents to present the document to uh, here in Puerto Rico they call Registro de la Propiedad, which is a database of all uh, deeds. We uh, to formalize the um, the surface surface uh, right deed. We form uh, we've registered that in the Registro de la Propiedad. So in the future. Uh, the families will not have the problem of the document, uh, the lack of documentation of the of their property. So it's not the it's not a simple solution, but it's something that the community choose because they they know that if they continue, um, because in Puerto Rico the elections are every four years, so. What what is happening or what, what will continue happening in Puerto Rico is that politicians go to the community and say to the community, no, uh, don't don't um, be a member of the Fideicomiso de la Tierra because I will give you a property right, individual property right. But the community 
these communities understand that if they continue to um, um, having this uh, individual conception of the land tenure, they will be replaced because not only the gentrification uh, that brings the, the Proyecto Enlace on the bridge because the value of, of, the, of the land will, will rise up, but also we here have problems with Airbnbs. We are we here uh, have problems with um, I don't know if you if you see the El Apagón video from Bad Bunny, but uh, we also have here problems with the 20 and 22 uh, ads or 60 ad uh, with the people with uh, rich people coming to the island and have um, this fiscal paradise and they are buying properties. Um, right now I am in my home, but in front of my home, I have two Airbnbs. One of them are from a local family that uh, after Eureka Maria, they lose their, their jobs and they convert the, her house in, a, in an Airbnb. But I also have the situation of an Airbnb uh, that its owner is a company not a, re a, a, a real person. So when I need to uh, have, a, when, when I have a problem with the, um, with the music, high music or um, the people uh, outside um, start uh, uh, gritando or something like that, uh, I don't know who, who I call. So here in Puerto Rico, we have this problem too, that the rents are, so high, so people in the Caño Martin Peña recognize that that will happen to the community. That they already know that that happened with the community El Fanguito and Tokio. That I don't know if you know, uh, in Puerto Rico, we have a, a stadium called El Choliseo, with our urban artists um, and a lot of artists from all uh, uh, music styles. Uh, make concert here. Well, the community in this, uh, uh, the, uh, the place that is constructed this uh, stadium, they call Choliseo, was a community. And that community was uh, relocated because of the uh, risk of floodings or, or urban floodings. And they has been moved uh, from there because they were in risk, but right now you have a concert a stadium, you have one of the most expensive area in Atorrey, and the community know that that will happen to them, so they, they choose a collecting land tenure, uh, tenure. But it's not uh, as simple as that. It, we have some problems um, right now in Puerto Rico after Huracan Maria e Irma, um, and uh, the, uh, the cost of construction um, rise up. So we have so many problems to um, uh, construct uh, housing in our district. So the people are, um, right now there's no so many options of, of houses because if we are conducting the relocation process as a, as a public corporation, we have to comply so to uh, many laws, included the Uniform Relocation Act that that um, requires that the uh, house comply with the same secure and sanitary. So, um, so that's rise up the cost of construction. And right now, well, well people are are uh, re being relocated and. Most of the people, like 90% of the people, if you if they can choose a house in the community, they will choose that, but there's no so many options right now. So that's I, I know that I didn't answer your, your question at all, but so to let you know that that this is not a, a, a perfect project, it's not a one size fit all. It is a continuous process of uh, learning and co-producing uh, knowledge and solutions for these informal communities. Yeah, no, yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, William. I, I will say that um, th there, is, there are a couple of things. W one is that in the case of Puerto Rico, even though it's a territory of the United States and we know that there is there, there are lots of things there in the history of that in the problematic thing that is there, it's a Latin American environment, I will say. So there is a, there was a process of translation of, uh, for example, the community land trust that has its origin in the US. There was a process of translation to uh, a Latin American environment on, on one on the one hand, but also uh, also to, to what uh, Joaquin was putting in the question, also in the legal aspect, and that's part of also what uh, what I checked. Uh, there was also a translation from the uh, American uh, common law legal system to the civil law uh, legal system. In the case of uh, Puerto Rico, even though there are rules of the common law and of the federal system in the US, there are codified rules. There, there, there was a, a civil code, for example. Um, yeah, we have both of the, uh -huh. of the systems. So yeah. it's a so it's a mixture of things. So that's why I will say, and this is also um, very very much my opinion. But that process of translation also of the legal institutions to the Latin American type of law, that's also uh, super helpful for anybody in Latin America that is trying to have an initiative of this type of um, uh, fideicomiso. Comunitario Tierras, or, or or all of the other mechanisms that there are here in in the case of the Caño, to uh, have at least half the work already done with that translation that has been done. Of course, it has to be tweaked; it has to be uh, accommodated. But for example, and and that's maybe just an example that I would like to give, the surface right. That's something that doesn't exist in the U.S. In the U.S., they talk about long-term leases or building leases. In the case of Puerto Rico, they uh, use the derecho de superficie, uh, and that's something that exists here in Peru. And you you will know this, uh, Joaquin, and all the others. Uh, the derecho de superficie is also something that th there is in the civil code of Peru, and that's that's a long way uh, of already a path that has already been gone, and that's uh, something that we can take if we are experimenting with some of these ideas here because that's something that has already been uh, used there in, in Puerto Rico with institutions that we we already have. So for example, the derecho superficie both in Puerto Rico and in, in Peru is an inheritable um, right. So you will have that passing to your heirs once uh, some someone dies. So that that uh, I think is what uh, what Emilio was saying, what, what William was saying. Now just uh, to maybe have an, uh, a, 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 a clarification on this because that's also something that uh, came to my mind with the question of Joaquin. Uh, so let's say one of the families that are in the in the system of the of the of the fideicomiso of the community land trust there in El Caño, um, they have their deed of their surface right right, or they 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 are in the in the system they are in the system the, of the fideicomiso. So in one of the slides, it said that uh, that uh, uh, surface right, that right that you have on, on your house, not on the land, but on your house, allows you to uh, sell, maybe to even to lease, maybe even to mortgage it. Uh, but usually when you mortgage any property, the mortgage will, what will allow you to do is that you borrow some money and there is the mortgage and if you don't pay, the bank will come and the uh, property will be sold and it will be sold uh, uh, very freely to whoever can pay them the most. And that's what makes it a little weird to me because here the selling of the house, I will imagine shouldn't be anything totally free because whoever is buying is buying into a community, is buying into the Fideicomiso. So how... So my my question will be, I think it's maybe same, the same question of Joaquin, how uh, sellable, how um, how marketable is the surface right of the families, and uh, or is it is it a surface right that belongs to the family, but it is actually with some restrictions on who can buy, who can who can who can acquire this, and in what terms. That's what I will be more curious, to, maybe to know with some experiences that you might have with this, yeah. So we are facing this challenge too, right now. 
um, as a difference of the CLT or community land trust in the United States, our um, uh, surface right deeds have a, a clause. I, I don't know how to say it in English, that um, states that the property will have, uh, that the Fideicomiso will have the first option for buying the house, that the Fideicomiso, that the, you can en 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 enajenar. Uh, transfer, maybe transfer. The, the, the land. And so we are uh, in negotiate negotiations with the uh, local banks and uh, the secondary market, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and all these mortgage houses, etc. So they uh, first understand the uh, land trust, um, uh, la figura jurídica, um, but also today recognize the uh, implications. Um, so there have been uh, little uh, steps forward this conversation, but, but um, what we know is that we will not ne negotiate the, uh, that clause, uh, esa clausula de, for, for enajenación. Um, so they are they are um, already cediendo. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but the negotiations are in our odds. So right, um, right, right now we, we are pulsing with the with the with the banks and let's let's this, see as it, we, we are winning right now the, this fight. So um, also. I would like to to add two two things. One related uh, to to uh, larger business um, is the that for the families is a family want to sell the house and move to another place. They we we can also extend the surface right outside of the district. We also can um, buy properties outside of the district and make it part of the land trust. So that's that's um, a cool mechanism because as you may know, the Fideicomiso are a nonprofit organization as a nonprofit organizations need money to conduct the operations. So we um, depend on um alquileres and also the rent the rents and also we have uh grant writings for the operational cost of the land trust um so i have said that i want to add two things the other thing is uh, more from at uh, at Kitur. um i'm in the uh, preparation for this class i asked samantha uh, the comp uh, the the composition of the students um she told me that there are also architects here so one of the other challenge that we are having is that the the size of the lands there's there's no when when you uh when the the ad was passed and the land was passed from the government to the uh to the Fideicomiso or to the land trust, they didn't say this lot, this dial lot is for you. They said that all public uh, uh, lands in the district, inside the district, was passed to the to the Fideicomiso, but they didn't they didn't identify the 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 lands, so they didn't do the complete on um, job. That just was, uh, se lo tiraron al fideicomiso de la tierra y haganlo ustedes. So, so right now we have so many problems to identify that, that public land and convert that land and register the land in the uh, registro de la propiedad. But we also are facing challenges in because there, there's a lot of, of 
lots uh, or fincas. I don't know how do they, do you call the land spaces in in Peru. We, we call them predios, also fincas predios. sometimes. Okay, yeah, the lots, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so we have a lot of backend lots uh, here, but as the community want to um to construct a house single houses or viviendas terrera no sé cómo lo llaman en, en el Perú oh, pero way, viviendas viviendas terceras did you say terrera Samantha sabe <laughs> like but single house like single family housing that's okay, uh, okay. a good way to explain yes yes so uh, in Puerto Rico, the, the colonial situation brought off that the people don't want to live in uh, apartments or uh, tan houses or uh, we call it here medianeras, which are uh, houses, uh, row houses is a, is, a, is a translation. So in the Caño Martí Peña is not, is not uh, uh, different from the rest of the island. Everyone in the island want to live in a single housing family, but to be in compliant with the Decente Segura y Sanitaria of the Uniform Relocation Act, Secure and, and Decent um, Sanitary Houses, the houses must comply with uh, some specifications of, of uh, the patio, the uh, how many rooms they have the spaces so we're uh, facing challenge in in architecture um we are because the designs not all the designs fit the the literal spaces uh in the in the land trust so that's also a, a challenge um but also um the community are now start to thinking that well i would like to remain here so maybe we need to understand that single family houses will be it will not bring uh so many options to all our people um so many families will need to uh, go outside the district and so right now we are in this conversation because right now uh, we are uh, starting to um, develop those houses. So it's an ongoing conversation. Thank you, thank you William. And we're close to, to the time. So maybe uh, if there is any other uh, common question, I, I know I have brought the discussion too much to the law side, so maybe we have to bring it a little bit to the planning or to the design side uh, side of things. But uh, uh, yeah, any other comment or question? And if not, maybe also you, Samantha, you might have something there. Yes, uh, I'm gonna give the students a chance to ask maybe one more question if they have any. Otherwise, I, I have a couple that I would like to talk very briefly about. And maybe I'll start and if students have any questions, just raise your hand or, or interrupt us. Um, so the, sorry, was there someone there? Okay. Uh, so the first question I had was related to, a, to what you were mentioning right now, this um, act that makes it uh, required for all housing to be decente, segura y sanitaria. I, I, I understood that that's what like the law says that all housing that the government or in this case the corporación or el fideicomiso el, el need to provide, and I think you were mentioning that this description of what the sente is is related to, for example, uh, the area or if they need like a backyard or if they need like a, a specific size of housing uh, so and I think the, the reason why I, why, why I wanted to maybe talk very briefly about that is because we've had a similar issue in 
maybe not exactly similar, but somewhat related in, in Peru, where some uh, residential areas have passed ordinances or legal uh, documents to restrict the size of apartments, for example, to uh, limit the possibility of having like low cost housing or social housing or public housing, whatever, whichever way you want to call it, in those uh, residential areas that are mainly occupied by high income families. So uh, I think it, I just wanted maybe to, to talk a little bit about how uh, legal frameworks can sometimes make it complicated to implement some uh, projects that are looking for maybe a less segregated or a more integrated or more equitable distribution of, of land resources services. So um, I don't know if maybe you can talk a little bit about that. And I think that's interesting to some conversations that maybe we've had in the Peruvian context in um, the past few months or years, yes. So the, the, the legislation of the uh, Uniform Relocation Act is a federal legislation. So most of our uh, income from, for this project are partially federal funds. One dollar of federal funds you need to comply with the federal uh, uniform relocation act. I it, I think that it, that law has a a good spirit, um, and not necessarily are too restrictive, but is a law made for the United States mainland that not necessarily uh, applies well to the uh, conditions, cultural conditions, and um, the reality of Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico is a lot in different way, culturally, um, what the housing meaning, the how do we the design here is different from the US mainland. So um, this, uh, the descent uh, requirement um, is inside the house, like having uh, a good cabinet, having a, a privacy in the bathrooms, um, having a, um, a I'm anti fuego, uh, fire alarms, um, some that's those kinds of things, but also that the community is not located in a risk zone, uh, like a floating area, etc. So, right now, we're having a challenge, uh, in the in, with that, uh, last thing of the floating area because. The Caño Martin Peña district are in a floating area, like a 90% floating area. Uh, if you use the fear maps of FEMA, the Federal um, Emergency Agency. So, so right now we are um, facing uh, this challenge of, of trying to uh, com uh, comply with the with the uniform relocation act and I also agree with the with the your argument about uh, how legislation can exclude people and um, complicate those this kind of projects um, with on purpose or be, because it's not it's not necessarily a proposito, but I occasions with it is on purpose, but are occasion that the people that is writing the laws have not um, living these problems. So when the, the people that will be affected are not included in the, in the writing of the laws, in the conservation of the projects, maybe you are um, 
um, making bigger a, a real pro a real problem. So so I can have a a, 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 a direct uh, example here in Puerto Rico. We have a regulation called Reglamento Conjunto de Permisos, which also have a signing um, the the rules for the signing. So when we pass the uh, when we create this project, it's also a comprehensive plan with sounds um, plan. So you have a comprehensive infrastructure plan and social plan, but you also have a land uh, use uh, plan. Um, right now in Puerto Rico, um, they are writing a new code uh, or new regulation for the zoning, and they are um, not recognizing the our plan. So uh, we have found this in the in the past. Uh, in the in the tribunales, and we prevail. And um, probably, if they right now does uh, not uh, include the the Caño Martin Peña special planning district in their uh, new re uh, regulation, we will fight it again. Thank you so much for for that uh, explanation. I think. That actually leads me to my second question. I, and I think we have a few minutes for that, but I want to give the students one more chance to, to ask their questions. Okay, I'll go ahead. And if anybody has another question, I think we, get, we also have a few minutes for that. Um, so my second question was related to to these different actors that are part of this process. Um, as Jose Carlos mentioned this also in his comment earlier, and obviously you touched on this on your, on your presentation. The, the context in Puerto Rico is very particular and much more complicated than maybe other places because of their relation to the US. Um, and I think so. I'm, and now you were also mentioning how this is not only so the actors are not only like US or federal actors that are part of this process, but also sometimes in the same island in Puerto Rico, how different agencies maybe not always consider what has been done from the bottom up in the Caña Martin Peña in these like processes, for example, in the example you're mentioning of land use zoning. So I think it was, uh, I don't know if you can maybe talk a little bit about, so this project is uh, almost 20 years now since it started. Um, and the US Army Corps of Engineers and the federal government of the United States has only this year allocated the budget for the project to be implemented when I think the original timeline for the project was, was supposed to start a long time ago, um, uh, almost 20, like 18 years probably ago. Um, so maybe talk a little bit more about that uh, complexity of uh, different actors being part of the process and if you can talk a little bit about also how do you think the next years will be in this uh, what seems like a more cooperative uh, uh, like relationship with the federal government which is something that maybe hasn't happened until now so that that confluence of different actors and making people like work together in a project and uh, what does that look like or what do you think that might look like in the next years? So first of all, I have to recognize that it's not an easy project, but the community organization make it easier because I'm a public, um, worker so i work for the government but i know that the government not always have the reason 
that not always have on uh, that the that don't always listen what they said. But we are here to conduct a project and implement the project. So when the things goes uh, difficult, the community is there, reminding us why we are here, why they organize this themselves, and that they will be continued there, struggling and fighting for their rights. So that's made it easier for us because sometimes you you is uh it's difficult to be part of the government and at the same time you know that there's there are budget limits there are um political issues um uh, partisan issues and um, also they they are uh legal um restrictions so recognizing that is frustrating sometimes but the community is there they live there um they are so busy our our headquarters every day so um um that uh that's made easier the the implementation of the project uh, as you were saying um this is a, a, a the public corporation the last corporation where i i work for was created because of that because nobody um Carreteras, the authority of, of, of Carretera in Puerto Rico, know how to make carreteras. The Department of Vivienda know how to make housing. The Department of uh, Natural Resources know or should know how to defend um, uh, our natural resources. But they don't know nothing about a comprehensive of this project, the components of uh, infrastructure, the components of structures, um, the social, um, um, the, the social problems of that are facing these communities. They don't know uh, about the needs of uh, a, a business development in the area, so the people can remain there, living there. So, enlace is the. And last thing in Spanish means a, a thing that that um, reunite all these people and uh, coordinate the implementation of the plan. It's have been very difficult. It's not easy. Um, we here, as I said before, in Puerto Rico, elections uh, are every four years. So the people that you are talking right now, then it will pass four years, and maybe you need to start again the conversation. But you also have uh, another uh, ledger that is the federal government. So this project is the uh, results of community organization, consistence, um, people recognizing that as professionals have an obligation to listen what they said, um, but also Maybe some luck, maybe um, the to be consistent permits us to be in a moment indicado, in a tiempo indicado, con las condiciones indicadas. So, um, and it happened. If you ask me in December last year that the US government will recognize the funds, I will tell you, you're crazy. That will not happen the next year. And in January this year, the announcement, the announcement was made. So we were all crying. We were all happy because as planner, or as social worker, or as a community advocate, you don't have so many projects that you can see that, whoa, this is becoming becoming a reality. This, is, this will change so many lives, but also will serve as a pathway or blueprint for future generations, how things can be made different, and how um, you need you you can uh, put in the same um, table, community, um, third sector, government, and as equals, not as uh, um, hierarchy of power. 
So I think that the, that the key is the consistency of the community is the key. Right. I think we're, we're with the time, but uh, thank you so much, uh, William, for for your for your responses to to our questions and also for your presentation. And uh, as I said, uh, the experience of um, uh, El Caño is one that I think we're following closely. So I hope that uh, we are somehow in touch and we can share some experiences and some some ideas as well uh, in other spaces. So thank you so much. Just a virtual clap to to William for for his time and for um, having this time with with us this uh, Saturday morning. <laughs> now, th thank you for for inviting me. Thank you, Samantha. We we already know each other in Puerto Rico. She helps this project a lot. Um, so I'm looking forward to learn more about a uh, Peru situation. I would like if you have some readings, um, and send it to me. But I will also um um seeks for uh, collaboration on uh, intercambio in the future with the fideicomiso de la tierra um uh, this is a continuous process of learning and co-producing uh, knowledge so i will be open to you and I, I am thankful for having me here in this morning thank you everyone thank, thank you, you thank you